Holmes St. Matthews. Please stand and join with me in the call to worship followed by the opening prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Through the incarnation of the word. that all nations may be brought out of darkness and see the radiance of your glory. O oh God, by the leading of a star, you revealed your Son, Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles. Grant that your church may be a light to the nations, so that the whole world may come to see the splendor of your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us join in singing, We Three Kings. seated and I understand that miraculously Pastor Powell is going to be speaking to us. Good morning St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. I pray that you have had a safe and glorious Christmas and New Year's and uh, that you and your family are doing well this morning. Right now I'm driving with my family back from Colorado where we've spent a week with uh, our family, those that could make it. I have several uh, family members who couldn't come or felt it was better if they didn't come because of compromised health situations and this in pandemic that's still with us. 
So I'm praying for you today and bringing you greetings from the road. We'll be back uh, in the area this afternoon and this coming week and certainly with you next Sunday. But in the meantime, we know our plans and God's plans are not always the same, but we are trusting that as we move into this year in faith, that not only will God's grace and sovereignty support us, but the Holy Spirit will be guiding us as we move into ministry together. And today is an example of that because Ryan Blank is there to share with you the gospel message. And uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing it on Facebook this afternoon. So in the meantime, God bless you and keep you and yours. And we'll see you very soon. Bye for now. Hey there, you are one fine looking camel. Why, thank you so much. You're not from around here, are you? That's true, but how did you know? Well, it's pretty obvious. You have two humps, and the camels around here have only one. What brings you to this part of the desert anyway? I work for the Magi, and they've been following this star, looking for the king of the Jews. In Bethlehem? Are you kidding? Well, that's what I thought, too. At first, while we were traveling here, King Herod brought us to his palace. I thought, this must be where the king of the Jews is. But King Herod said he was looking for him, too. Tell me more, please. Inquiring minds want to know. So he sent us on to continue our search, and as we were following this strange star in the sky, it suddenly just stopped, and there we were, right in front of this new king's house. The king of the Jews was inside with his mother. I don't remember seeing any palaces in Bethlehem. What was it like? Actually, it was pretty much just a hole in the wall sort of place, but the Magi recognized him right away and started bowing down and giving him gifts. I didn't expect that. That's crazy. I thought so too, but I was glad to finally be there. My feet were killing me from carrying all that gold. Gold? My goodness, I really didn't expect that. I've got to go find this king. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel, uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay, pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. 
Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. God's word for his people. Good morning and Happy New Year. Based on the uh, number of people I see out here, it looks like uh, not everybody stayed up till midnight on uh, Saturday night. So we've got a, a pretty good crowd here in the, the congregation in the sanctuary. Um, welcome to Epiphany Sunday. And uh, as some of my, uh, I guess, former colleagues or, or cohorts now, as a, a former youth pastor, I'm still part of these different Facebook groups of youth directors and youth pastors. Uh, they would call this Youth, uh, youth Pastor Preaching Sunday um, because typically the, the senior pastor is on vacation and the youth pastor gets to fill in the, the, the spot. Um, so we're, we're going slide this. Uh, they somehow, I guess, when the, the storm blew through, it, it took the, the slides that I uploaded to the cloud and, and blew them away. Um, so uh, it's, it's not the, the first time. I remember this was back about seven or eight years ago when I was at a, a school up in Santa Clarita. Um, I... It's a kind of a small classroom, small charter school, and on kind of a front table, I had a projector set up, with, you know, so I'd run through my PowerPoint slides and all that. And uh, it was kind of a tight fit going around that table to some of the desks. And a student walked by and just knocked the projector on the floor, right first day of school, first period. And so I was without slides for the entire day. So we, we learned to roll with it. Um, well, let's dive into this. Um, so I've mentioned this many times before, but I grew up in a non-denominational evangelical church. Um, so I grew up knowing very little about the liturgical calendar. Um, we didn't follow the lectionary. We didn't uh, celebrate things like uh, Pentecost or Baptism of the Lord Sunday or Epiphany. Um, you know, basically just the pastor would start in the book of Genesis and preach all the way through the, the Bible. And then, you know, after a couple of years finishing, he'd go back and just... That was just kind of the, the way they did that. So, you know, they would do special sermons for uh, Easter and Christmas, but that was uh, about it. Um, so I figured since we're here on, on Epiphany Sunday that I should do a little research since I don't have a lot of that background information. Um, I've only been a Methodist for about 20 years, so you know, it takes a while to, to learn these things. Um, so I turned to the most reliable source of information on the Internet, uh, Wikipedia. Um, 
And I found that uh, epiphany is not actually as simple um, as I thought it was, that uh, depending on whether you're Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or Western Protestant, and depending on what country or even part of a country you're from, uh, you're likely celebrating something different or celebrating it in different ways. Um, in most traditions, including our own, um, our own Methodist tradition, Epiphany celebrates the arrival of the Magi, which uh, Marilyn read the, that story for us. Um, in other uh, traditions, it celebrates Jesus' baptism, um, but we have a separate Sunday for that in the Methodist Church. And in others, it celebrates uh, Jesus' first miracle of turning water into wine. Um, so, again, uh, quite a variety there. Um, and as I said, it's celebrated very differently. Um, on the Wikipedia page, it's, uh, just about every country that parades through on, on the Olympic opening ceremonies has a different way of celebrating. Um, but just a few, there's the traditional king's cake where they, they bake a cake. And this is, I think, originally from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, but I, I believe also some uh, Latin American countries celebrate it where they, they take a little baby Jesus and, and bake him into the cake, which seems a little weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, whoever gets the, the piece of cake with the baby Jesus in it, um, if you don't swallow it, then it's your job to bring next year's cake to the, the celebration. <laughs> Um, there was one tradition uh, called the, the chalking of the doors, where they you know, put chalk on the doors, which is sort of a sign of blessing. Um, and then one of my favorites was the winter swimming. Uh, this is actually in, in northern, uh, particularly European countries and such, where they would have a, an outdoor uh, celebration. And the, the priest uh, or local clergy would, would offer a blessing on a, a crucifix, a little handheld crucifix, and then throw it into the local body of water, whether a lake or, or river or something. And then everybody would jump in the water, or those who wanted to would jump in the water and try to uh, bring that up. And whoever brought up the, the crucifix got uh, a blessing. Um, so I figure after this, after service, we can go down to the Leisure Village uh, community <laughs> pool and uh, celebrate that. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure they won't mind. Um, and then, of course, uh, I was looking at our own Methodist uh, information on, on the Methodist website. And I really like what I came across here. It said, um, the arrival of these visitors, the, the Magi, was a sign that the incarnation of God in Christ had been made known and was recognized by the heavens to the whole world, so that even Gentile wise men from the east came to pay him homage. And this is an observance of great majesty, solemnity, and awe. So doing all this reading, I um, realized it kind of gave me a lot to, to think about, a lot of options for what to uh, talk about this morning. And uh, after you know, some thought and prayer, um, decided to focus on the, the story most familiar, the arrival of the Magi. Um, there's two points that uh, I want to make, so I'll just kind of throw them out here. As a, a good English teacher, you put your thesis statement at the beginning, and then you work you through and then come back to it in the conclusion. Um, so the, the two points I want to make is that first, uh, the Magi found the Christ child because they knew what to look for. And we too will find the Christ child if we know what we're looking for. And then secondly, uh, like the Magi, many others around us are looking for Jesus. And we, like the star, um, need to point the way for them. So these couple things in mind, uh, which would have been up on slides, but we can just imagine them. Um, let's dive into the story. So um, as you know, Matthew's telling of the nativity story varies quite a bit from Luke's. Uh, Luke's focuses primarily on Mary's story, which we've been uh, which Pastor Jim has been taking us through the last couple weeks. Um, Matthew's story uh, skips the actual birth of Christ. Um, there's no trip to Bethlehem, no manger, um, no shepherds. In fact, uh, Matthew's story doesn't even start in Bethlehem, uh, but starts in Jerusalem with a band of wise men before the whole uh, Joseph story, which we dealt with uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but it starts with the uh, wise men showing up in Israel's capital, asking about the birth of a newborn king. And uh, a lot of this points to kind of the, the differences in the author's purposes um, in writing their gospel accounts. Matthew um, seeks to establish the kingship and authority of Jesus, whereas Luke uh, is more intent on proving the historicity and universality of his gospel story. So from uh, that reading and research that I did, uh, Magi's, Magi were actually astrologers, primarily from Persia, um, who believed that, uh, among other things, that the birth of royalty uh, were often marked with, the, um, with some sort of celestial phenomenon. Um, they saw something in the, in the sky. Um, they saw the star and determined it uh, uh, hearkened the uh, birth of a, a newborn king. And so they went to find this king and pay homage, uh, perhaps as ambassadors for their own king, 
uh, who wanted to make, maintain good relations in, in the, the neighborhood. Um, some scholars uh, trace the Magi back to the days of Daniel uh, in the Old Testament, um, the Jewish exile in Babylon. So it's likely that they knew from their own heritage and tr traditions to anticipate this star to herald the birth of a new king, uh, the new king of the Jews. So now imagine how Herod, uh, the current king of the Jews, and I believe recently appointed, um, must have felt when three foreigners show up asking about a newborn king. Uh, the text tells us that he was scared, uh, which is probably a major understatement, along with the rest of the city. Um, Herod felt that his own throne was threatened, and the people in the city were likely afraid of how uh, Herod would react to any sort of threat to his power. Um, Herod was known to be uh, paranoid and quickly eliminates any perceived threat uh, to his reign. I believe there's stories, I think it was this Herod, it might have been one of the others, who actually killed members of his own family that he felt might have been a threat to his throne. So, um, you know, he's scared, everybody's spirit, uh, afraid that uh, he might, um, you know, go ballistic uh, if, if there's a threat. And then plus, uh, being under Roman occupation, um, they knew that the Romans didn't look too fondly on political unrest and were quick to squash anything that threatened the peace that they'd established. So Herod, uh, wanting to learn more, uh, consults the religious experts. And uh, um, you know, from what I, I learned from some uh, scholars and commentators, that there is this anticipation of the arrival of a, a king who would once and for all drive the Romans out of their land and uh, you know, establish the um, kingdom of, of Israel once again. Um, but, you know, so there's kind of this anticipation, but they weren't sure, you know, they figured, well, they'd probably be the, the first to know, so they're a little bit confused when um, a bunch of outsiders, a bunch of uh, Gentiles, arrive and ask where the new king is. Um, so it, it clearly, uh, based on, you know, again, just that short statement, uh, blindsided the religious and political uh, community. So they consult the scriptures and send the Magi to Bethlehem, uh, but not before Herod tells them to bring back the, the details so that, as he says, he can go and worship, but he has you know, ulterior motives there. So the Magi travel about five miles to Bethlehem and find the Christ child, um, offer him uh, the gifts, which, of course, are for Christmas and his birthday. I don't know if you've seen that. I think it's an uh, Episcopalian uh, meme going around Facebook last week or so. Um, and then head home without going back to Jerusalem, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And then when Herod re realizes he's been hoodwinked, I like the fact that I could use the word hoodwinked in a sermon. Um, he decided the best way to eliminate any threat was to slaughter all the infants in the area. Uh, now, I'm sure we've heard plenty of sermons about who the, the Magi were or where they were from or their significance as uh, Gentiles in, in the gospel story. But I don't want to get too lost in, in the weeds there. Um, there's much to learn from their inclusion. But I want to go back to those main points I mentioned at the beginning. So first, the, the Magi found Jesus because they knew what, uh, what they were looking for. Um, as I mentioned, they were astrologers. Uh, they studied the stars looking for signs of what was to come. And since it was believed at the time that kings were divinely appointed, they looked for celestial signs uh, to mark the birth or coronation of a new king. And then just as a side note, something I found kind of interesting was that some have pointed out that astrology and other forms of divination are actually prohibited um, in the Old Testament law. Um, and yet God used a cosmic sign to get the attention of a group of astrologers from Persia, Persia to announce the, the birth of Jesus. Um, I think it goes to show that God can and will use uh, just about anything to meet us where we are and to reveal uh, God's self to us in ways uh, that we can understand. And in the same way, God uh, wants to reveal God's self to us, and God often uses things that are right in front of us, right in front of our face, to do so. Uh, but oftentimes, we aren't looking. Um, we miss these star. Uh, in the east, so to speak. Uh, as an example, um, to illustrate this, there, there's a, a poem that I like to teach uh, in my English classes. Um, I've used it uh, twice for demo lessons when I was interviewing for, for new jobs at different schools. Both times I got offered the job, so it's you know, kind of that nice uh, trump card in the back pocket for me. Um, but it's a, a lesson based on a poem called Metaphors by Sylvia Plath, an American poet from early part of the, the 20th century. Um, and in this poem, uh, she uses a, a series of metaphors to describe something about herself, um, but never really comes out and tells us what it is she's describing. Um, it, it's sort of a, a riddle um, in some ways, and it, it's a, a good way to kind of teach students to you know, look really closely at the text and, and kind of read between the lines and, and decipher these metaphors and figurative languages, you know, figurative language and such. And um, you know, so 
you, I kind of take them through line by line to, to see what she's, she's describing. Um, I'm not going to tell you guys what it's about so that you guys can go home and, and look that up on your own. Um, but once someone gets it, once someone kind of realizes, oh, is it, you know, and they, they get the right answer, um, and tells the class, and the poem takes on this whole new meaning. Um, you know, we can go back through it and realize, oh, that's what she means by this. That's what this means, and, and just kind of work our way through. And I think that the same thing can happen in our, our faith journey, whether it's a scripture passage we've read a hundred times or a prayer we've recited over and over, or maybe something in nature. Uh, that thing can take on new meaning and significance once we dig a little below the surface or perhaps notice it again for the, the first time. And uh, maybe we see those things um, in light of a, a new life experience or something that just gives a, a new sense of meaning. So uh, my first word of encouragement to us is that we keep our eyes and ears open to what God might be trying to say to us in, in this new year. Um, even through the most ordinary things that we might pass by a dozen times a day without even noticing. We need to pay attention to what is around us and look for God working in our lives. Like the Magi, we ought to be well versed in the heritage and traditions that we find in the scriptures and in our own uh, faith traditions but we also need to be well versed in other areas um, i believe that all truth is god's truth even if it comes from unlikely sources my second point from earlier is that there um, are those around us who are looking for jesus but might not even know it is jesus they're looking for like the magi they might just be uh, looking for signs in the stars so to speak maybe they're looking for peace or healing or meaning in life uh, but we, like the stars, can point them to Jesus. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that we are the light of the world, and the light of our good works will lead others to, quote, uh, glorify our Father in heaven. A good friend of mine, um, you know, I, I usually after I, I finish a sermon draft, I'll send it to, uh, you know, Pastor Jim and to, to Jack and a, a number of other uh, friends who are, you know, pastors or, or you know, former seminary grads and such, um, just to get their feedback and thoughts, and, and a friend of mine offered some uh, thoughts and uh, an observation that um, in, in the chorus of our, our opening and closing hymn, We Three Kings, the line, Star of Wonder, Star of Light, marks this sort of transformation here. Um, like the Magi, we're drawn to the Star of Wonder um, into worship of the newborn king, and then we go out into the world as a star of light to shine um, into the darkness of this world. And if you remember the story um, in Acts chapter 8 of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, um, the eunuch's traveling along uh, this kind of southern road, reading from the, the scroll of Isaiah. And Philip, being prompted by the Holy Spirit, goes up to the chariot and asks uh, if the, the eunuch understands what he's reading. And he says something like, well, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So Philip just kind of hops into the, the chariot and talks him through what he's reading. Um, you know, explains the, the, the gospel message as told from the Old Testament uh, prophet. And when they reach uh, a nearby pond, the, the eunuch asks if he can be baptized. And uh, Philip baptizes him and then goes along his way. Um, and I wonder how many people out there in our community are just like that Ethiopian eunuch, just waiting for someone to come along and tell them about Jesus. They've been searching and looking and reading and trying to understand and just need someone to befriend them and talk with them. And perhaps more importantly to our present context, how many of us uh, will have the, the courage of Philip to come alongside those seekers and share uh, in their stories and answer their questions? So to kind of bring things to a, a close, um, another friend of mine um, who's a, a pastor of a, a small church in um, Orange County, um, I listen to his uh, ser Sunday sermons. They publish them as, as podcasts. Um, pretty regularly, but uh, I listen to him pretty regularly, and he always concludes his message with a, a couple of questions for the congregation to ponder throughout the week, so uh, I thought I'd do the, the same here. So two questions for you, or kind of one's a, a two-part question, but um, where do you see God at work in your, uh, where do you see God at work around you, and what are the, the stars that point you to Jesus, and then secondly, how can we be a star that points um, other seekers to Jesus as well? So with that, uh, blessings on a new year. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today with hope, 
with renew feelings of renewal and with joy in our hearts for a new year and unending promises of what can be. We pray with those at the Woodland Hills United Methodist Church and Westlake Village United Methodist Church that they too may feel your the closeness of you and that you will wrap your arms around them. We are grateful, Father, that Donna is recovering from lung cancer surgery and has, and has a successful treatment plan in mind, and that Doug has also had a successful surgery to remove a large polyp. We know, Father, that there are those who are missing loved ones this Christmas season. Lynn and the family on the passing of her husband, Chuck. Marv and the family on passing of Judy. And all those others who we hold in our hearts that we know who are missing loved ones. We also pray for those in hospice, the end of life care. Richard's mother and Carol Tripp's mother. Father, there are those among us who are ill and need your support to continue their healing. <clears throat> we pray that Debbie will get better from her sore throat and come back and be with us next week. There are many on our prayer list, Father, and we would ask your help and your blessings on them and on the doctors and nurses and caregivers that are around them. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for those in Colorado who have lost their homes, nearly 1,000 homes gone, families that had to move out quickly with only what they had with them. We are grateful that there is either no loss of life or very, very minimal loss of life. And we pray for those that were injured. It seems as though nature has been kind of on a rampage, and we would pray that help will arrive for all of those all around the country and around the world who are suffering from natural disasters. We pray for those, Father, who are in cancer treatment, that insidious disease that doesn't care who, they, who it attacks, and with COVID also. Be with us as we go through into this new year, Father, again with hope and with love in our hearts for everyone. We pray this with the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite you to prayerfully be grateful for the blessings that you have received. And uh, we will, after that, have our offering.
Heavenly Father, we bring these, our gifts and our offerings to you, knowing that there are those who will, do, who will distribute them to do thy will and thy work in thy world. In Jesus' name, amen. And let us join together in a final verse of We Three Kings. Please remain standing for the benediction and be, then be seated and there will be a short video afterwards. May we go now as a light to the nations, honor the Lord, preach what you know of the risen Christ and fulfill all righteousness. Amen. That was one of the shortest videos I've ever seen. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Kaneo Connect is starting on um, the 11th of this month, and it will be the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th at 5:30 at Thousand Oaks United Methodist. And that's the one I believe that's right by the Jewish uh, Adad Elohim, not Adad Elohim, um, Ace Hayem. You see, you get all these things when, you, when your roofmate is, is Jewish. You, you understand a lot of things. Um, there are many different uh, things going on in the life of our church this week and upcoming. Uh, trustees meeting on the 8th. Quilting returns. To Wednesdays. Sorry? Okay. Um, boy, it must be St. Matthew's. We really have to be flexible, don't we? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Next week is Holy Communion. Um, and also the men's group is returning on Zoom in the fireside room, maybe on the 12th. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, Debbie, get well quick. Anyway, um, <laughs> the women's group is uh, meeting on the 20th at Stella's. No, on the 8th. On the 8th at Stella's. Well then. <laughs> you know, see, it helps being a teacher. As Ryan said, you have to change your lesson plans immediately on the spot. So we have several ber uh, birthdays. Um, Wendy's is today. Dennis King is today. Carol Tripp is on the third. Marillion Freeman, I don't know who she is. She's going to be a teenager. <laughs> oh, I remember I was a high school teacher. I love teenagers. And it's good because now I've got two granddaughters with teenagers. So, But she's on the fifth. Um, and Emmy on the sixth. Our altar flowers this morning were given by Janice McMahon, and we thank you. They are beautiful. So, without further ado, welcome home, St. Matthews. God bless, and have a happy new year. Thank you.